Well, hello to today's uh, Evolution Hour, installment number 16, September 13th, 2017, um, on the subject of the origin of life, or abiogenesis, as the scientists put it. Uh, it's a topic which pops up a lot in anti-evolution apologetics, and so it's kind of good to get us up to uh, stream on that one. I'll want to call attention to patrons on Patreon uh, that you can see on screen here. Stephen Bauman, John Buchan, Dire Wolf, Eat Meal, Mona Hafer, Jen B, Jody, Staggles, Totes Real, and Paul Williams. I'd like to thank all of you uh, for supporting Patreon. I naturally invite everyone in the known universe to support the project. And if you don't want to go the Patreon route, uh, there's also the GoFundMe uh, approach that you can do if you just want to plop five bucks down and say hi that way. Um, this is a long-term project, hopefully, that I can keep at long-term because there's a lot of work to do to build up a network of people to interconnect on all of these um, science issues and to make sure that we're ahead of the game on this. So, uh, starting off with the exciting world of origin of life, abiogenesis. <clears throat> In the old days of uh, Miller and Urey experiments back in the 1950s and 60s when they discovered that it was possible to go zot in a um, presumably primordial atmosphere and generate some amino acids, not little cr critters crawling out, uh, it took another 20 or 30 years before they began to really kind of understand the nature of the problem. Uh, and it involved a whole bunch of things uh, where they didn't know a lot of the pieces. Uh, they had to work out what the actual genes were that did stuff. Uh, a lot of that material, like homeoboxes and that, were only discovered in the 1990s. Uh, they also had to work out more and more about how metabolic cycles work and also what can go on outside of the little box that we're used to with DNA and RNA. Uh, by the late 1990s, it was becoming increasingly likely that RNA, which has autocatalytic properties, um, and uh, it turns out that the core of the ribosome that actually plugs amino acids together was an RNA molecule, not a protein, which kind of surprised everybody, except the ones who were saying, yeah, yeah, RNA world, RNA world, that there was a pre-system before this LUCA, last universal common ancestor, that's the thing that everything on Earth that's alive today was descended from, that would be kind of a bacteria-ish thing. Uh, may or may not have had organelles in quite the way we're used to. That's part of the process of having to retro-engineer what existing cells are and in what order they appear to work out what a primordial organism might have been like. And that's actually before the LUCA. So uh, it's been taking a long time just to kind of put together the pieces on the field. But we're now in a little bit better range of knowing more about what works and what doesn't. Uh, to advance the field. And anybody who wants to dive into the origins or bust field should be up on the modern science research so that they know what's been done, but also what hasn't. The short form is we don't know how life originated yet. We don't uh, have it pinned down to where you can put the primordial chemicals together and stir it around and poof, an uh, organism comes up. No, it hasn't reached that stage. And I caution constantly uh, pro-science, pro-evolution people not to overplay the hand on, oh, they've constructed an artificial organism by rearranging yeast genomes. No, that's not origin of life thing. It's a beautiful science work, but it's not the resolution of the problem. Uh, what we've got at the moment, though, is a much better understanding. It's looking like of the two components of life, the metabolism part uh, that uses energy uh, and biochemistry and other things then generates work, output, information, and so forth and so on. And then the replication side of things, there's a system that makes copies of itself that um, I would contend that the view is more likely that metabolism has to come first before replicators. And, uh, uh, oh, um, Wallace Arthur and others have argued rather persuasively that if a replicator kicks in early in the origin of life, before the metabolism cycles are there to generate the raw materials it would live on, it will exhaust that in a hurry and probably go extinct. So metabolism first is one of the factors. Now, the big question 
that's been broiling in the sciences is what was going on uh, before DNA. Because it's looking like DNA was not the original system tool, the scaffolding. And it's not merely that there's RNA going on. And we find traces of these little RNA-based systems lurking around like in the core of the ribosome. Uh, but what you've got beyond that is um, the idea that there might have been a training wheel biology before you even get to RNA. Uh, there's a PNA. Uh, which is a different one that also has autocatalytic processes. And by the way, I put a whole, oh, about half a dozen technical papers up uh, in the um, uh, video description. Recent work, except for the case of Ferris's stuff in 2005, not because work on the clay memorialites uh, that acts as a scaffolding for replicating DNA and, and amino acids um, isn't uh, recent work, but none of the recent work I could find immediately online full text. And what I want you to be able to do is to click on the links that are in the uh, notes and that you can go and read that. And the Ferris one from 2005 is a nice summary of the field. All the other ones are, are relatively recent work, 2013, 2014, 2015, and so forth, uh, including a brand new juicy little paper on the ups and downs of the RNA world and, and the, the puzzlement of both the advantages of RNA and the downsides of RNA in terms of folding and other kinds of things. And another paper that had popped up about uh, freezing and thawing cycles, temperature variations could have been playing a really significant role. It's a gigantic puzzle to try to pe peel apart all of this, especially when it's looking more likely that the original replicator system is nothing that's alive now that all of the living organisms are based on what ended up as the LUCA, the last universal common ancestor that has um, a, a, um, a RNA-based uh, ribozyme that generates um, proteins uh, from amino acids that are encoded for by triplex codons that are coded in a DNA system, but that the actual generator makes an RNA template of it. This is all a very rigid system that probably took a couple hundred million years to kick in, although that's an eye blink in the early stages of life. Uh, but once that was in, that was basically the winner that won. It just outcompeted whatever might have still been straggling around. If there were any PNA replicators or RNA exclusive replicators, uh, they're gone. Um, the other fun part is the idea uh, that DNA might have been a parasite that these early RNA replicator systems got parasitized by DNA. Uh, uh, DNA doesn't autocatalyze as effectively as RNA does, but, in fact, I don't think it autocatalyzes much at all, but it's really stable, but not too stable. It can be pulled apart effectively and yet holds together really nicely and forms those double helixes relatively easily. You can find double helix RNA. You can find triple helix DNA. There's a whole bunch of variations. And pieces of that still play parts in our existing biology, a, a relatively minor, but it's still lurking around in there. And the interesting question is what of those are fossils of the older system still lurking around or, one of, or which of those are just convergence where the same systems pop up that were popping up prebiotically. We still don't know the answers to these questions. Uh, another parenthetical point I should uh, put in here is that uh, the only people doing work in this area are evolutionists. As far as I know, no anti-evolutionist has ever lifted a finger on any of the sweat equity. So all they do is come along after the fact and carp and authority quote and twist and turn. It turns out, for example, every possible objection you can come up with to uh, the RNA world or replicator systems or the error threshold in replication accuracy. These are all the, the uh, issues that pop up in working out how life could have originated naturally. Every single one of them was brought up by evolutionists because they want to know what the actual solution to the problem is and they're going to be constantly trying to address every possible objection to it. And bit by bit they're overcoming some but new ones pop up. Um, the issues of chirality, why are, is all life more or less based on, I think it's left-handed spinning molecules, because the, the DNA can twist and proteins can twist one way or the other. And there is a, a preponderance of one version over another. And uh, it was a bigger issue in the past than it is now, although anti-evolutionists who riff off of old stuff keep on haranguing about uh, the chirality problem. But there's a lot of different little measurements that occur in the actual world from shock waves from stars to magnetic fields and other factors that skew the chemistry 
in one direction versus another. And I didn't cite a mass of technical literature on that because, you know, it would, it would overload everybody's brain, overloads my brain. Uh, but I did put a paper on the homochirality problem in the various links, uh, a recent one that you can follow up on. And uh, if you poke around the various works and the source citations in it, you can get caught up to speed on that. Um, the metabolism issue, there's some really neat stuff in there from Brackman in 2013 and Patel's paper from 2015 uh, on um, uh, how metabolism systems can be worked into uh, hydrothermal vents and uh, prebiotic chemistry that relates to lipids as membranes and the things that package cells are another interesting issue as not yet fully resolved. Um, and bit by bit, they're trying to piece together um, uh, the, uh, the components. I kind of view the um, matter as a, not unlike that of flight. The, for, for many years, a lot of great scientists were pondering, could you fly? Could you build heavier than air aircraft? And uh, some smart asses like Simon Newcomb actually did the calculations on this uh, and said, nah, you can't you can get anything bigger than a cockroach to fly. Uh, and he managed to do that calculation in 1906 at just the time that those bicycle mechanics from Dayton were actually flying their little airplane around uh, in public. So this was one of those oops moments. Uh, life is way more complicated than flight because you're having to retro-engineer an entire prebiotic system of which only the tiniest traces of which are present in the final replicator that we find in the, the LUCA system. So it's not an easy problem to do. So where are we at the stage? I think it looks like we're in the zone where we've got a lot of the players laid out. It's looking like pre, we, we, the metabolism first issue. Another interesting question that's just now being thrashed out is, was the original coding system that was used, even in DNA, was it two codons or three? Argument to be made that there was a duplex system that only used two codons, and that the third one that's now ubiquitous in all living biologies in LUCA uh, was a hitchhiker. It was a later development, uh, and it has to do with codon wobbling. There's a whole technical literature about how loose that third codon is in terms of uh, assigning things, and that that allowed the expansion of the genetic code. Uh, a, a pared down duplex system generates fewer amino acids, but the amino acids that we know they code for, looking at the existing code, are the ones that are the most easily synthesizable in prebiotic experiments and are the ones that are most commonly used in proteins. So the suspicion is, is that duplex system is a viable one, but there's still going to be probably years more work on that. Uh, I shall stop for the moment so I could glance over to the long string of comments in the section, which I've not been able to do because I didn't look over there while I was getting the show going up. So I'm going to uh, say hi to Corn Lips and Stephen Bauman and uh, Omega Felis and Beach Price and all you gang, Richard Richardson, uh, who are just saying there. Uh, Robert Richardson pointed out Thero's nucleic acid. Uh, wasn't a joke. It's a synthetic polymer that seems like it might be a precursor or it did. Yeah, in, I, I was almost going to include some of the papers on that that uh, it's another one of those fascinating systems that um, interact and produce a whole bunch of biologically interesting functions and that that's looking like one of the elements that were being involved in addition to this PNA system. A uh, very good of you to bring that up, uh, uh, Ralph, uh, Robert. Uh, and then uh, just trying to troll down here to see what else we've got. Uh, bum, 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 bum. Um, Many of you are bringing up the notion, yes, creation is like magic. That's the alternative to the natural evolution thing. Is it magic or not? And um, it, uh, it's one of the reasons why the origins or bust argument is so incredibly uh, attractive. Because if you can say, well, where did life come from? If you can't explain that, then you don't have any evolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Problem is, do we need to know how life originated to explain things like the reptile mammal transition or birds developing out of dinosaurs billions of years later? And the answer is no, we don't. Uh, life could have been absolutely a full-blown zot miracle Yahweh going, boop, let there be uh, archaebacteria, and then let it on autopilot after that. None of that changes the data stream that we see afterwards in which billions of years of bacteria go on which is uh, perfectly understandable from an evolutionary point of view because bacteria are very slow to modify 
Uh, it's one of the reasons why they're so bloody durable. Uh, they're not species in the normal sense because they can change uh, genes back and forth through lateral gene transfer and yet still stay pretty much bacteria. A lot of the multicellular stuff came about when bacteria had indigestion endosymbiotic processes where one branch of bacterium didn't get digested by another and forms a cellular system like a mitochondrion inside of the cell and life takes on a new format because of that uh, cooperative aspect. Um, but if you're trying to use origins or bust as a pry to get rid of all the data that you don't pay attention to, uh, and it's not going to cut it. And if you know enough about the current work to not press too far, but never avoid pressing at least as far to say, yeah, we know an awful lot more about it. And it looks like it's natural. Um, it, more that we're looking at how things can happen. Some of the things that were thought really difficult, uh, like uh, where some of the uh, nucleotides for RNA came from, there was one in particular that was just driving everybody nuts because they couldn't figure out how to generate it abiotically. And then it turns out that if they just remember to put phosphorus into the prebiotic vent, uh, thermal vent down there in the, in the volcano, uh, bingo, uh, it's generating it automatically and fast and in huge abundance. So that's a Sutherland's uh, work on that. I didn't cite the paper, I think, on that. Um, although it may, it may be that's one from, uh, it might be that one from, um, uh, I'm looking down here in my notes on there. Uh, the, um, might be that Patel paper. Anyway. Um, the work is progressing and it's really quite fascinating. Oh, Robert uh, Richardson puts up, um, funny you mentioned this topic and the creation is to say if we can't make life in the lab then it didn't happen. I spent the last week having that exact argument on YouTube and boy, everybody will have that argument on YouTube and Twitter and over coffee tables and Thanksgiving dinner. It's inevitable. It's been going on. The, the biogenesis debate back in the 1860s and 70s. I've got a section on that. Uh, in uh, tip 1.7 on the uh, biogenesis issue and, and why it was such a distraction. I'll put a link up on that. Everybody go uh, to my stupid website and read my crap because otherwise it doesn't do any good. Blah, blah, blah. Fill in the plug. Um, if, you, if you'll go there, you'll just uh, look for uh, tip 1.6 and you can find an HTML version uh, at uh, the uh, MIR website. That one's a training wheel site that was developed as a um, stand PDFs. Apparently everybody on an iPhone uh, with these little bitty screens just can't stand PDFs and I don't blame them on that. But anyway, um, uh, in tip 1.6 there's a whole section, or uh, tip 1. Uh, whoops, uh, I should say uh, yeah, 1.7, my mistake, my bad. Um, Yes, Stephen Bauman, RJ has a website, yes. Uh, I will put that in again there, www.tortukan.wordpress.com, and you can find at there uh, the links to all, all the material in PDF format, and that's there, and um, uh, the um, links to my books are there, and the links to the Patreon and the GoFundMe are all up in there, and the various debates that I've done, and so forth, and a link to the YouTube channel, so um, I'm, I'm still all new at this. I'm an old fart who comes from an age of rabbit ear television sets and dial telephones. So uh, cut me some slack. I'm learning as I go on this and I've been making progress. I only started doing YouTube just this year. So this is all wildly new to me. Thank you, SciStrike, for uh, helping to get me up to speed and making the little opening logo and all of that. Uh, it's... Um, Oh, Stephen Bowman says, I love PDFs on my iPhone. Is that meant sarcastically uh, <laughs> or not? Uh, I, I stuck with the PDF format in TIP. Oh, you can't edit it. So I didn't want anybody poking in. I'm not WikiLeaks. Uh, I'm not uh, Wikipedia where um, I want people um, tinkering with my work. Uh, and nowadays, uh, you can download those things. They're in ubiquitous format. Um, they're easy to handle. Uh, and you can do text searches and stuff in there. So uh, it's um, a, a relatively handy format. In future, and here is this thing, because um, it's all from volunteers helping me and all that, because I have zero money. I mean, that's why I got the damn GoFundMes and all that. I'm, I'm not rolling in dough here. Um, I would eventually like to upgrade the main website to make it way more user-friendly. The first task is for me to understand more about how to edit WordPress. Uh, to be able to figure out how to put the links and all that in. Once I understand that, then I'll run amok uh, because I'll be able to figure out what the file format I need to do to put in 
so that I can update effectively and start putting in hyperlinks and a lot of other stuff. My, my task is first to do the indexing. Um, the, the Origin of Life material is actually the biggest gap because I never did get around to that section, uh, which was going to be, I think, in Chapter uh, 8 of the old book. And, uh, oh, uh, Robert Richardson is asking, uh, what under uh, part 1.7? I don't see the part of the index to which you're referring. Yeah. Um, um, if you're getting the PDF, you'll want to go down to uh, the Michael Behe um, uh, into the web stuff. It's right after the Dover stuff. It's towards the tail end. And there's a section in there. Uh, there should be a listing right in the front of the PDF of that uh, biogenesis and Louis Pasteur and all of that. That's the section that discusses all of that because it was a big deal for Louis Pasteur in that era. Pasteur tread very wide, carefully in that area. In fact, he avoided using origins or bust arguments. And, and, and as I noted in the text, uh, he actually advised against using that kind of an argument uh, because it means if you're going to pin your belief um, in um, uh, anti-evolution and God on the origin of life, what if they crack it? and they create life in the lab. Does that mean you have to become an atheist? And he warned against that, that that was a philosophically slim position. Um, <laughs> Paranor, RJ, you may not be rolling in dough, but you're sure fat with shill bucks. Oh, I wish I could use shill bucks to buy food with, but that's another matter, or, or pay the electric bill and all that. I'm squeaking by this month, uh, but one thing is tough on the other. Um, Fino 3000, as you might want to go to Michael B. He is not something you hear said often. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean the section on Michael B. Uh, I was talking about his um, uh, um, opening salvo about um, uh, bacterial resistance uh, that he discussed at the Dover case. And what was fascinating about that was how he um, was... Um, jumping way off of a particular source, and he never did follow up. That's what I discussed in that little section. Later on for Evolution Slam Dunk, I went into that chloroquine case because that popped in relation to, that's a Plasmodium falciparum and the, uh, the malaria case, uh, where he was trying to use that to remove the reptile mammal transition data without actually discussing any of it. And that I go into in quite a lot of, of detail on that. But in the, along the way, one of the ones involved in that impopinum resistance was Mark Toleman, who's a British creationist. He's a microbiologist actual scientist and uh, uh, I so I took that opportunity because Toltman literally has only written one thing venue and it was a wandering mess on the biogenesis debate and so I decided I was going to have a little interlude where I would have a sidebar that I would discuss that and I went off and, and finished that and I also wanted to get the origins or bust concept up in the tip work uh, by that name. I've been trying all through my work to come up with simple terminology that describes phenomenon. And the origins are bust, I thought, was the perfect one because that's how everybody uses that kind of an argument. It's not an argument about how life originated. It's, yeah, yeah, you can't explain it, therefore my side's right. And it's an easy dodge, but it misses the work. And the work is now so absolutely fascinating. Uh, Jackson Wheat says, shifting the goalposts. Yeah, uh, that's a cottage industry in anti-evolutionism. It always has been. Uh, they've been safest with origins or bust because it hasn't been cracked yet. But boy, all the other areas, when they try to draw lines in the sand, it's tough. That's why natural theology, which is the sidebar to uh, origins or bust in the uh, generic anti-evolutionism argument, which is basically God of the gaps. And if so, if you imagine a big pyramid, God of the gaps is the basic, and then it splits into natural theology where, oh, isn't nature fabulous and obviously designed because it's so wonderful and complicated. And then when you start looking closer and closer and closer, no, we're seeing gene duplications and microevolution and uh, point mutations, and you can start experimentally retroengineering, and you can th see how all this stuff has worked out. It starts looking just natural, doesn't it? So people tend to shy away from that at some point. And it takes somebody with a lot of stamina and a lot of data avoidance to be able to try to sustain a natural theology argument when the origins are bust is a safe little turf and and grassroots creation has jumped to it instantly um <laughs> i'll try to look through here the uh slash tag incompetent design yeah that's that's i have a whole section in um uh the uh, creationism light chapter um of the old tip and all of that stuff there's 
all of the old book that I'd worked on and couldn't get a publisher for about 10 years ago is about a thousand pages altogether. In fact, some of the longer chapters, by the time you get down to chapter four, five, six, um, they're book length uh, on their own. Um, and that was one of the reasons I was realizing that I was creating an encyclopedia. I wasn't creating a damn book. This is never going to be published as a single work. And that's when I um, switched over to a website format where space is no problem now. I, I didn't get to it until 2009 when the computer technology suddenly exploded and I finally could afford a new computer and discovered gigabyte hard drives. Hey, where were you in the era of floppy disks? Uh, I literally had to keep the chapters and the indexes and all the, the source material smaller than 1.4 megs in, uh, before 2004 because that was the size of a floppy disk and I couldn't save work um, uh, independent of the computer if I didn't do that. So all of that changed. Thank heavens for modern microprocessors and that all you people out there who don't realize how primitive computers were 15 years ago to realize that you have the tools available to do spectacular things and you're doing them but it's only as good as the data you're inputting it <laughs> abby normal rich robert richardson said yes that's the brains that was used in young frankenstein you are trying to trick the aj here are you not frau blucher <laughs> anyway uh, so do we have any other questions now that I'm actually paying attention to what's going on in the chat room over in there? Uh, uh, yes, I remember nine inch floppy disks. I barely remember that, Robert, uh, that mine was the smaller size. I remember the six inch style, the black ones, and then they started switching to those little itty bitty ones that were in the little plastic caddies. That was the style that I did primarily. Uh, the old DOS prompt type, yeah. But if anybody's got some questions on what I've been saying or comments on what I've been saying so far, uh, I do advise everybody who has an interest in this area to go ahead and use the, um, uh, follow the links on any of those papers so you can pick one that, that looks like, ooh, that sounds interesting. Uh, they're all open access, so you can uh, download them. I, I, uh, most of them are available in PDF format if you click. I gave usually the HTML versions, but some of them were on uh, uh, various server websites, college people have put up material. Uh, I'm a great believer in open access of information, and the more you read the original material, the more you get to see the science direct and you also get to see who's doing the work and where it's going. The only 41 got some old tech access because my dad's an engineer. Yeah, I, I, I came this even earlier. Um, I was involved on um, a program when I was still in uh, er the early years of high school. So this would be late 1960s. And I was involved in a thing where we got to go over to Gonzaga University to do programming in F Baby Fortran with punch cards uh, on their RCA Spectra 70 or whatever it was over there, this monstrous computer that probably has about as much memory as a modern remote control. Uh, and, uh, and to do a relatively simple mathematics thing. I think we were doing basic addition or something like that. And it took a whole bloody stack of punch cards to be able to do that. I mean, this, and then my brother, um, was a, a computer programmer and still does. He does some um, software vetting and stuff uh, and testing for uh, Microsoft uh, to this day. Uh, and my um, niece's husband uh, is involved in uh, the computer industry and that as well. So I'm, I'm knee deep in family members that are miles ahead of me <laughs> in terms of the technology. So I, I'm just kind of, I'm a user clunk. I use the word processor and I use the spreadsheet. Now I'm using things uh, uh, that um, are new tools. I, I, I'm always, I don't care about the format, though. I only care about what the content is. So I'll use whatever venue it comes up. I, I'm, in effect, prostituting myself in a way by virtue of the fact that video is a really slow way of conveying information. Uh, written words and, and reference noting and the like that you get in science literature is just chock-a-block. If you look at a NOVA special on any science subject uh, and look at how it looks neat and it can be very gripping and informative, but how little science data actually gets presented during that. And it's same for paleontology shows, fossil material, that um, if you manage to glean half a dozen science works in the course of an hour or two hours, that's a, a data-heavy show. And it might even be based on even less. Or they have to glance past it so quickly, a lot of data content in there, it's still kind of at the skim level. It's like, the, it's like a visualization of an abstract. 
And it can be very powerful and useful because people are often very visual, and I'm very visual in, in uh, um, uh, thinking about the things. I much rather watch a movie than read the book that it was based on, typically. But in terms of the science, there is no substitute for the primary source material, and that ain't videos. Uh, that's ultimately the science work. And the more people get used to being able to play on that field, the more effective we'll be to in network together to combat the woos out there who are way too powerful at the moment. And um, we want to always have the best arguments available. We want to have this information at our fingertips. Um, BJ Price uh, points out, that's why I prefer lectures. A good lecture can be immensely effective. We've had at Eastern, Eastern Washington University, my old alma mater, it was State College back in the ancient days, um, has a series of Darwin Day lectures that have just been splendid. And I come away from those with notes after notes, pages of them, of, of material that I've copied down with the references that are, and that I follow up on them when I get back home. And, and they have been very, very useful. One good lecture, if it's done by somebody active at the cutting edge of a field, can be like a gold mine. Um, Robert Richardson, another, uh, uh, see, I can see the little flag, the little orange James Downard, so I know you're referring to me directly. That pops my eyeball in. Uh, says, two different creationists with whom I was arguing about origin of life said that they were, quote, being researching the subject for 100 years and haven't been successful yet, unquote, therefore impossible. Yeah, actually, he hasn't been researching it for 100 years yet. They didn't know what the hell they were doing. You couldn't even start asking the questions until the middle of the 20th century because you didn't know what DNA was discovering homeobox genes in the 1990s. Those are the genes that form body plan structures. Uh, it was only, in, or I think around 2004, that they discovered that the uh, ribosome core is an RNA molecule. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of stuff where you just got to do the basic research. We still don't know how lightning is formed in a thundercloud, and that's way simpler than anything in the origin of life question. And it's not an easy thing to do because you're basically having to do either retroengineering from existing biology or starting from prebiotic conditions and you gotta work out what were the prebiotic conditions. If you forget to include something like phosphorus, um, you may get a, a, an erroneous answer. But Jackson Weed's quite right, yes. Operan was just basically guessing at origins in the 1920s. Uh, that's quite true. Uh, they were, they were, it was a logical question to ask. If life is all originate, uh, developing naturally, how did it start? And it has to be something that's taking place in an environment uh, that would match up with what we understood. The, the, uh, Operin was thinking in terms of the methane ammonia atmosphere, which turned out not to be quite true. And uh, so they uh, very quickly in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s had to work out um, and did a more uh, um, accurate ones. One thing we know from the fact that there was no ozone is that ultraviolet light's just boring down on the planet's surface. And so the idea of Darwin's old warm little pond is the least likely scenario. Uh, you, you, if you have things originating underwater, now you're using the sea as an insulator, and it acts in the same way that our ozone does to feed out um, deleterious mutations from deleterious radiation that's pouring down on them. And the discovery about all of this fascinating chemistry that goes on around deep sea vents, now we have the idea created long before photosynthesis, long before any need to see sunlight, that that's just an add-on. That what we see ubiquitously as photosynthetic systems are way down the road. It's not even sure, matter of fact, if memory serves me, I'm riffing off my memory. I don't think LUCA was a photosynthetic system, and no one is expecting that it is. Um, uh, it, it, if you're a young pup now, just coming online, uh, I would be gobsmackingly surprised if in the next 50 years we don't know a hell of a lot more than what was discovered in the previous 50 years. Uh, but even if it turns out that you can't crack it, it could be that it's too difficult to do. You'd need a, a vat the size of Connecticut and you have to stir it for 100,000 years. Well, you ain't going to work that experiment now, are you? Uh, if that turns out to be the case, it still doesn't make all the evolution since go away. It doesn't make the reptile mammal transition go away. It doesn't make the ALUs in our genome go away and their retrotransposons. So always when dealing with somebody who tries to bring up 
the um, uh, reptile or the, the origin of life question. Um, be aware of what the data is and don't let them pull that origins or bust trick to make them evade all the later information. Oh, we got some questions on Linnaeus in here. Uh, Fino, who was Linnaeus? Uh, oh, he's back in the 17th century. Um, early 18th century, if memory serves me, uh, he was um, Linnaeus is the Latinized name. Everybody who wanted to sound fancy uh, turned their own name. I think he was from Sweden, and uh, you you change your name in there. Um, uh, um, Linnaeus was a creationist in the sense that everybody was a creationist at that time, and and I. Um, uh, Jackson, I'll, I'll actually, Jackson Weed, I'll, I'll kind of disagree with you about Linnaeus not uh, being honest. Um, he was doing the best he could at the time. He was very influential. He was coming in a world when they ha didn't really even know how much life there was. This was just as the age of exploration was going on, but that explosion of species, uh, the explosion of microorganisms that they were discovering with the new microscopes was just starting up during Linnaeus's time frame. And given... Um, the circumstances of the time, the fact that he plops human beings down with the primates in the, in the primate uh, uh, family uh, is an astonishing observation. So given the time, yeah, yeah, I, I think Linnaeus is a fascinating character. How he would have reacted uh, to the science and that that came along in the next centuries or two after that is another member. Uh, so um, uh, you, you found that the, the really difficult time was for people living in the 19th century. Now there was all that data to contend with. And you had a split up that became increasingly bifurcated on religious lines. Back in Linnaeus's day, it wasn't so big a deal. They, they didn't realize how old the earth was. The new geology was just being developed. Uh, they were still talking about whether rock deposits were formed from volcanoes or floods, uh, Plutonism versus Vulcanism, that there are kind of clumsy discussions of the issue of how much is sedimentary versus how much is volcanic and all that, that that would later take on a completely different context in the 19th century and then a completely different context in the 20th century once we understood plate tectonics and and rearranged the continents but uh yeah I, i'm i'm more charitable i'll cut linnaeus more more some slack than uh, uh than others uh robert richardson puts a flag with my move the goalpost guys, I redirected them to common descent by asking about uh, hyposcorbemia. Oh, oh boy, I just clumsy it on my pronunciation. Um, and all the hafarini, which I think are a variety of primates. Why do we have the exact uh, um, gene break? Yeah, those little typo errors, those particular splits, um, the the, the um, uh, introns and all of that are the typographical errors of life. Locations are very diagnostic. <laughs> oh, uh, Fino was asking about the chronology. Yeah, yes, uh, I, I think it was. I think he's from the 17th century or early 18th century, and it's it's quite a ways back on that. Um, I confess to uh, often forgetting the details and dates on an awful lot of these earlier people because so much of what we now know is based on stuff that was worked out very very later. Uh, by the way, we're they're um, in a mess of argument about whether or not they should junk Linnaeus's binomial system, this the genus species approach to identifying organisms, because it's just, there's a group of cladistic systematics and others that just can't stand it. And uh, uh, the, it's a big debate because it really has trouble dealing with transitional forms and almosts, uh, because it's by definition a pigeonholing system that it's either one or the other. And I did a lecture, one of the earlier evolution hours or one of the comments on that uh, about the systematics issue. Uh, that's an inevitable one. I don't lose sleep over it because uh, the organism doesn't change independent of what we label it. And so long as you recognize uh, that if you're looking at say a transitional uh, area, you're probably gonna find a certain amount of squishiness in the ability to identify what genus or species something is, and that's because it's almost, uh, and that's exactly what you should be seeing in a, um, a transitional form. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, uh, uh, yes, you've got a pain Australopithecus um, bunch in, um, uh, or Homo habilis on the Homo side, but why isn't it uh, Australopithecus habilis? Uh, in other words, that, that you now get to hair splitting at the nodes. And uh, you, whenever you find those kinds of squishy details about which group something should be lumped into, it's probably because you're dealing with a transitional node in the cladistic tree, and it'll pop up as such. Um, one of the things that you find, big issue, 
because these debates are exactly the grist that anti-evolutionists feed off of in their carpings. They will talk about the confusion in the systematics and they've discovered something new. There was just a posting um, up on in, um, the uh, Discovery Institute from um, uh, Gunter Beckley, who is the intelligent designer's new uh, paleontologist. They have one at last. Uh, and he's an insect paleontologist and I have been waiting, waiting, waiting for that guy to actually post something uh, up at the Discovery Institute and yay, uh, they did it just today. And so I haven't pumped it into my tip bibliography yet and he cites some technical research so he belongs there right off the bat. But it's looking like vague, annoying, hide the ballism that Jonathan Wells does. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, Beckley tries to plow his way through the fossil. He was talking about the new bird finds, that new, um, discovery of um, uh, a, a flightless dinosaur bird that's got um, um, uh, feathers uh, on its uh, uh, hi uh, hind limbs like Microraptor, but it's clearly not a flyer. And indeed, it's probably just a conventional dinosaur and therefore convergence issues. And of course, convergence is just something which um, intelligent designers and creationists love uh, slamming into because they can say, this is the confusion of evolution. They don't know diddly squat. Ah, Carl Linnaeus, thank you, uh, uh, I-33, 1707 to 1778. Okay, I, I had him a little too early. Yeah, so he's a contemporary of the time as the American Revolution is getting off the ground. Uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, Bach are alive during that period. They die in the 1750s, uh, as I recall. And so there's an awful lot of overlap. Uh, George III um, and um, little baby Napoleon and Beethoven. Uh, are knocking around during their periods and are starting to come up. Uh, the French Revolution is not quite off the ground, but it's about to. Um, and the new geology is starting to be developed. I think Hutton uh, is around in that same time frame. And by the time Linnaeus is dying, there are the rumblings of enormous changes in the sciences. Uh, remember, 1778 is about 30 years before Darwin's born. Effective on that, and we know what shit hit the fan then. <laughs> Ah, uh, so any other questions that pop along? I'll seem to go along in there. We're at 540. Um, I uh, uh, have tried to do as useful a kind of cutting edge summary on the uh, origins issue. Um, I was trying to hunt around for that paper and I couldn't find it on the issue about duplex versus um, uh, triplex DNA in the early biological system. I don't think it was in the title on it. I've forgotten who had written the work on it. Uh, the difficulties of, of um, accumulating information, and yet a lot of it doesn't get printed out on there's no ink. Uh, but I, that slows me down a bit. But they, I, I hope the works that I did pull up uh, will be relevant. Uh, the one on the um, uh, RNA problems down there in SOSTAX is really fun because that shows you in practice how the scientists are um, aware of the problems that they have to uh, accommodate, uh, that there are positive aspects to RNA replication systems and there are downsides to it. The, the error correction uh, catastrophe problem is one that hasn't yet been fully resolved. It's that if a replicator can mutate fast enough to evolve effectively, fast enough that it falls apart from too many mutations, what's the threshold? What's the boundary layer? What's the selection pressure involved? And because we don't know the playing field, we don't know what the early replicators were. We don't know what the early metabolism was. Uh, we don't know the role of these non-DNA systems. Um, it's a crapshoot, so it all has to be worked out kind of retroactively. Um, Robert Richardson brings up, I always recommend the people who doubt origin of life research go tell NASA, the Ames Research Lab, specifically at the JPL about it. Um, the JPL, ironically, was the place where David Copage worked for a while. He's a young Earth creationist and remarkably annoying jerk who was finally let go and there was a big cause celeb over it. The intelligent design movement was yelling bloody murder over his persecution and never mentioning that he was a young earth creationist. Uh, he's got a website, uh, Creation News, I think he calls it. I've got a ton of his sources in my bibliography because he is just a gold mine of snark. He goes through and ferrets through um, the, the current science news and makes nasty comments about it. 
uh, and uh, he, he's very diligent at it. I mean, it's just vomitously interesting. But anyway, the, the, uh, the, the current NASA research is highly relevant because of all these places that look interesting, Enceladus, any place with water, how do you hell do you get liquid water so far out in the solar system? Well, it gets tugged and there's radioactivity and there's all of that gra gravity from its main planet and all that that makes it interesting. And, and it opens up the prospects that life might, quotes, accent underlined on the might, uh, develop in places that aren't in where we're used to thinking of them. If you have, for example, a big moon that's almost planet size orbiting a gas giant that's orbiting very close to a relatively dim sun, but you're close enough that you're in that habitable zone. And we know there are solar systems that have those dynamics. Things are much more interesting. Uh, we'd like to know whether or not there was ever life on Mars. It might still be there in bacterial form, hunkered down, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, it'd be amazing if it were. Uh, there might be life in Europa, which is another reason why they want to send a probe to burrow down through its big ice cap to see what's going on in its water oceans underneath that are putatively there. And uh, then the other question is, what kind of life? Is it like what we're used to? Is it carbon-based? Is it DNA-based? Does it use RNA? Does it use something else? You know, we don't know. Uh, and uh, if you have more examples to work with, then that changes your dynamic. At the moment, we're it. We're the only life form that we know. Uh, everything is based on DNA and uses RNA. It's based on proteins. It's based on carbon uh, chomps. Um, if you're used to that acronym, um, I think that's it. Uh, chomp, chomps. Um, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur. Uh, that are the um, primary uh, components of living systems. Take those elements out and you don't have anything but trace elements left. Um, see what we got down there. Oh, uh, the Europa report. I haven't, I haven't heard about that, Robert. Um, uh, the, uh, it, it certainly the science in all of those areas are absolutely fascinating. Uh, I've gone from a time when I was young, uh, in the 1950s, uh, to where Alpha Centauri was an odd star that was the nearest one. And we knew of no solar system anywhere in the universe other than our own. There was not any knowledge that any other place had a planet. The, the astronomers pretty much suspected they did, and we had science fiction stories of galore about flying out to planets and seeing all that kind of stuff, but we didn't know. In my lifetime, we've reached the stage where we actually know how many planets Alpha Centauri system has, let alone all these other thousands of them. And the, the instruments will only get better and bigger and bigger and bigger, presumably, if we can keep up NASA and the new head of NASA, who's sort of a gee whiz technology booster, otherwise nincompoop climate skeptic, um, we'll see whether or not that has positive or, or bad benefits at all. Um, if I had my druthers, we'd have a planet that was more Star Trek-y and more peaceful, and the hundreds of billions, trillions of dollars we spend every year in the, on the planet for military weapons, we'd divert a few hundred billion of that collectively as the species to have a really boisterously aggressive um, space exploration program that would include manned exploration. As a planet, we could easily afford it, as well as getting rid of poverty and, and uh, uh, starvation. Uh, the, 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 the physical resources are there, we just fritter it away on other stuff, which is a political issue. La di da. Anyway, Shah Roe uh, mentioned silicon. That's, uh, yeah, there's an interesting debate as to whether or not all life must be carbon-based. Carbon forms polymers that are just beautiful because they link together easily, but not too hard. So they can be pried loose relatively easily, but not too easily. In other words, molecules stick together. They form long polymers in carbon. And that's kind of, as far as we can tell, unique. Silicon will form silicates. The problem is they break up real easy water. A silicon-based organism, from the last time I read stuff on this, and it's, I admit that it's been quite a long time ago, and I don't know that there's been a hell of a lot of technical research on it since, but a silicon-based organism, the silicates in there would be so prone to water as a solvent that it would disintegrate uh, with the amount of water that Mars has in its atmosphere. I mean, this is not, <laughs> not something terribly good. Uh, so my, I would be gobsmacked if you could have a silicon-based organism. Similarly, there's the issue of um, uh, whether or not um, you could have something other than water as a moderator. Is it no coincidence that 
Water is the system that we use. We're 70% water in our molecules even today. Um, and our life originated apparently in a watery environment and so forth and so on. Uh, theoretically, ammonia could perform that function under very high pressures. But whether or not it has downsides in other little areas, plus smelling strangely, uh, we don't know. Um, it would be it, um, fascinating and exobiology, science fiction-y writers uh, will speculate on a lot of that stuff. And it's fun to do as a thought experiment just to kind of see. Uh, I'm much more of a carbon chauvinist. Uh, if you read the old uh, Gödel Escher Bach book by Hofstetter that goes into a lot of this, I, I think a good case can be made that, ev that life everywhere in the universe, if there is life and it occurred naturally, is going to end up being DNA-based because it's the system that worked really well. And those little carbon molecules in its little components uh, form just nicely and they interact and, and bubble along. They form linkages that are really nice and semi-permanent but not too permanent like the silicates. And... Um, it's um, uh, uh, probably the case that DNA is not a coincidence that that's the way it works. But show me another example, and we'll see what happens. So uh, we're at uh, 549. We're nearing down to the end of the show. Um, for comments about my presentation and uh, whether it was helpful to you and informative, I always try to do that. I try never to get wrong. Uh, I might have my head up my ass, but I will apologize if so. Uh, I try to keep up with the current material uh, and be aware of things. I like as much as possible to be open access so everybody else can look to, check the things, don't depend on my word for it. Uh, in fact, I don't want you to depend on my word for it, even as oracularly perfect as I tend to be. Uh, it's much better when you have a decentralized system where everybody is going in their own way, but yet they interact synergistically. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, oh, Shar says, Hollywood is at war with physics. That's an interesting comment. What do you mean by that? I'm kind of intrigued. Or is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I can think that Hollywood has always been terrible at the physics of their science fiction stories. Um, that it's very easy to go the route. Uh, well, Prometheus, but yeah, Shar uh, brings up Prometheus. Uh, um, Generally speaking, no one has ever accused uh, Ridley Scott of being a scientifically literate person. He's a filmmaker and a, a, a fascinating and thought-provoking one, but he isn't really a sciencey geek type. Uh, it's revealing that when he had Prometheus was a fascinating example because it's kind of a clumsy prequel to Alien. And um, Oh, uh, oh, Fino jumps in, so he'll short-circuit me. Yes, if you're coming to an end, you should humor Jackson. He asked after the memorialite a couple of minutes ago, and I pointed him to your links, but you didn't really mention that. I'm sorry. Yeah, I did have a reference in there on that. That's the old Ferris piece. Uh, all the stuff that I could find right off the bat in my bibliography are abstracts uh, or things that are, aren't full text yet. There's work going on, you know, currently on it and there's stuff that's in other technical papers that I, I uh, that aren't necessarily because they're all new they're not readily available the Ferris one was the quickest one I could find off the bat that was full text and uh, probably if you follow up on googling any of the material you should be able to uh, uh, track on to some newer material and uh, hit me up with anything you find uh, 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 Jackson has a wonderful little section um, of um, internal chats uh, over at Twitter and uh, he'll go poking around in material and put links up, and I'll go poking around and put material up on links, and I'll follow up on his stuff, and he'll follow up on mine, and we'll find new stuff, and sometimes I'll go, oh, I already had that in my bibliography, but I'll oftentimes I'll go, nope, I didn't have that. Ooh, that's interesting. And I'll find some new relevant to the points at issue and bring that one up as well. Uh, what I'd like to see go on with this network that we could be building um, is that we want to avoid having to do duplicative effort. In Jackson's case, he uh, stumbled upon a particular creationist claim, and I already knew the context of it, and I was able to tell him that. That saves him all of that work. He can now devote his effort to following up on that, his own perspective. He doesn't have to spend all the time trying to track down a stupid reference when um, I've already done that for him, and he can then leapfrog off of that. Uh, the more we do that kind of stuff, the better. Uh, on Twitter. Uh, I try to follow, whenever I encounter a scientist that I have in my technical literature, uh, who is on Twitter, I click to follow. Because that increases the probability 
that they're going to be giving me heads up on their latest work, which they do. So I keep up on, there's a, a whole bunch of them that I've got, particularly in the uh, paleontology and human evolution field uh, that are just delicious because they've got their fingers on the pulse of the latest work, not only of themselves, but of the various people in their networks that I may not encounter until way later if I bump into it. Because it, I, I've got, there's thousands of journals uh, out there and it's impossible for anybody to keep track of all of them. But if you have a set of spider tendrils out there, Backed up relatively easily. The same thing goes for uh, picking my brain on subjects. Please look at me uh, on Twitter or on the hashtag tip website. You can go there and you can ask questions about stuff, and I will be happy to say, you know, here's the information, here's the documentation, here's the background of something. Point to the sections if I've already written material on it, or maybe a case of, gosh, I don't know about that, and how research on it. I've encountered a lot of new. Uh, oddball creationists uh, poking up from people that I've encountered on Twitter uh, that I didn't know about, and I connect uh, this Rhoda guy who's kind of an apocalyptic fellow, believes in the uh, where the chariots of, of Exodus have been found in the in the Red Sea, and uh, I already knew about the guy he was relying on, but I didn't know about him and the connections that he had with some other creationists. Now I do, so I want to have a thing where I've got connection network that you can possibly do. Ooh, people are talking science fiction in here. Ah, I love Star Trek, but they drive me batty every time they say full impulse. Is that a speed and a cell? Actually, on there, um, from my uh, Star Trek geekism, I would say that's uh, referring to the impulse engines as opposed to warp drive. So it's uh, basically using a reaction engine of uncertain nature uh, that uh, operates like a rocket, but they can get up to the speed of light, but not beyond that. To do that, they've got to go into warp drive, which is something that the geeks at Star Trek have kind of sort of worked out, like surfboarding on hyperspace and blah, blah, blah. It's all magic. It uh, doesn't really matter. Uh, at least they're not talking about taking the Kessel run in 3.5 parsecs. Um, Fino says it's a speed, a throttle setting, and an acceleration. Yes, multipurpose. And then someone down below, uh, impressed by the expanse. I haven't seen that series. Uh, I hear it is quite good. Um, uh, my time is not infinite, so I have avoided doing a few things. I'm still catching up on the last ep um, uh, current season of uh, Doctor Who and waiting for the new feminine Doctor Who to come along. Yay! Um, but, uh, yes, impulse engines down the floor, clade starfish. Uh, remember, I saw Star Trek when it was on originally. I'm an old fart. And uh, for me, it was such a, a, a tremendous, <laughs> RJ will debate you on the Kessel Run. Yes, I-33. Um, it was such a game changer because there hadn't been a non, uh, an anthology series science fiction on in major prime time ever uh, before Star Trek. Uh, there had been Twilight Zone and Outer Limits that were anthology series, not uh, a, a narrative line, other than the old uh, cheesy Flash Gordon stuff and that from uh, uh, the early 1950s. So I was in a desert zone and then Star Trek came along and the Enterprise, the moment I saw that ship, it was like a, a miracle because it was so ingeniously different than anything anyone had ever done before with the nacelles and no conventional rocket look, no fins. This thing stays in space. It has transporters just a, a detail that they came up with as a way to avoid having to do the optical shots of the damn ship landing every time. So to have the transporter was cheaper. But when you thought about it, when I saw the show, I'm going, wow, yeah, if you have point-to-point -point short range transporters, why would you want to bring a ship down? That's unnecessary. So it, it jump-started the imagination in terms of what a ship should look like, how it could be constructed. The, the, the bridge was a stroke of genius in figuring out these various stations and ring designs. And there were a lot of people in um, ergonomics that would be looking at the way they were doing stuff on Star Trek and thinking new ways of laying out interior spaces uh, that was launched on. Plus the fact that we now have the, the flip phone was deliberately designed as kind of a riff off of the old communicator uh, in the Star Trek. And then later on, they moved to the little tap things on the new uh, series, which was a logical extension. Um, I'm, I'm basically pushing the glasses approach. You know, everyone should be wearing glasses in science fictions in the future because they all use them as their heads up display. But uh, that's something we'll see how everyone, because I don't think everyone would want to wear contact lenses. I couldn't. And who would want to have a, a, a digital implant uh, in there. That's a little too matrixy for my taste. So uh, let's have the glasses. This is uh, this makes much more sense. Uh, oh, you're quite right. Yes. Oh, Robert Richard has mentioned 
check out my favorite sci-fi movie period the forbidden planet actually there is a, a a complexity to that maybe we should discuss that in the after show if somebody wants to set up an after show um um at the same time that it's got very 1950s attitudes there's references to a, a woman biochemist that was the one julia marsden the the, the woman that married uh, morbius in the storyline that there's actually much more sophisticated thinking in that story lying under the the woodwork forbidden planet is also one of my favorite science fictions it's it's uh, uh one of the most expensive ones and was basically the the swan song of the early era of major science fiction films by that time mgm waited a long time and they pulled out all the stops and all that on it um but it's still one of my all-time favorites for an ingenious storyline and uh, a spectacularly vivid plus it created robbie the robot you know yeah. the guys that, that did the designing on it, it was a japanese um uh, art director um that designed both the spaceships and the um uh robbie the robot went on to do um uh, for erwin allen uh the robot and the jupiter 2 in um a lost in space a much stupider series but nevertheless a charming industrial design from the guy uh Beam says you saw Forbidden Planet on MS3 TK. I would I, I, that would have been intriguing to have seen whether how they could have parodied that. What snarks they would have made about it. Yeah, you can kind of make some jokes in that about it, but it is it's not a bad movie. MS3 uh, TK was always um, at their best when they were dealing with a movie that really wasn't very good. In fact, the movie version that was done where they went after this island Earth really was kind of borderline because this island Earth has a lot of interesting features to it. It's it's was probably one of the most serious science fictions that universal tried to pull off and um uh they didn't it's very 1950s super sciencey kind of and it's got some problems with it in terms of plotting and all the rest but it had some ambitions and some serious gravitas to it for universal's stuff as opposed to just the wolfman monster kind of shows that they were dealing with oh well we're getting near to the hour we're six o'clock i'm going to be saying um au revoir here on the stop broadcast and um, uh, anybody who wants to set up a uh, oh, um, an after show venue, uh, let me go. Uh, uh, let me uh, know about it because I'd be happy to join. Uh, I, I won't be doing it on my channel. I'm, I'm kind of pooped here, but I'm happy to join anybody else's. Uh, thank you very much for uh, listening and commenting. And uh, that's the end of evolution hour number 16 on abiogenesis.